Welcome back. Bienvenue de retour. Welcome back. For your information, you were more than 300 attending the first part. I'd like to welcome you. Most of you come from Luxembourg, but also from France, Germany, from the Netherlands, from the UK, and more exotically, uh, also those in the US who are watching us from Australia, Albania, and New Caledonia. The next topic is, uh, of course, of great interest to us all because we're going to talk, talk about one of the biggest challenges in digitalization, and that's the protection of our workers against infobesity. I think we all know this during the COVID crisis, we have become addicts to our tablets, to our PCs, to connectivity, uh, the division, the separation between working life and private life has become more difficult. Uh, and uh, we've seen this, this mass of information coming to us. Uh, these calls, video calls, one after the other, and uh, how can we manage all this is the big question. I'm very pleased to introduce a panel of experts who are going to answer these questions, how to manage information, the role of the manager, uh, the uh, role of uh, the organizations, and the risks of hyper-industrialization of work. Don't hesitate to ask your questions on the right-hand side of your screen. Questions arrive here on the screen direct for us to see and for our, for our speakers. We can keep in touch with you and have an interactive meeting. You can also talk to the participants, to the other participants. Click on participants. You have access to their names and fix an appointment. As uh, we've just said, there will be a number of breaks during the day uh, when you can chat with the other participants. I would like to give the uh, floor to Mathilde Delory, who manages uh, the uh, Offre for CV for, uh, for project, who is going to introduce the three guests. Mathilde, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Christian. Hello, everybody. Digitalization of our professional practice is progress to facilitate uh, the way we cooperate and make all sorts of communication possible, some of which we couldn't have imagined 20 years ago, but some that we couldn't have imagined eight months ago. Not only the communication modes are multiplying and going faster and faster, but the volume of available information doubles every four years. The result is that we all need to manage a lot of information, a lot of communication, and uh, a lot of cognitive uh, uh, tests during our day, a cognitive burden, which can lead to an overload. Infobesity, it's called, very present in our, among our professionals. With our guests this morning, we're going to identify the starting point to overcome this phenomenon and uh, think of uh, numeric digital well-being. Why is it so important, as Christian said, to preserve individuals in organizations, but also to allow the uh, knowledge management that is uh, favorable for the success of the professional activity as a whole? Knowledge means information that we need to work, what we know, but also humans, we are all of us, who manipulate information on an everyday basis, those who know. Before I give the floor to our guests, I would like to add to what, to what Christian said. This is an interactive forum. We will have time during the roundtable to answer some of your questions. So don't hesitate. Share your questions in the chat or send us comments on Twitter and LinkedIn with the hashtag SF, LSF2020. Now, to the heart of the matter, welcome to the three of you. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. Caroline sauvageau le -Riant. You are an expert in infobesity and information management, and you're head of uh, the SoComment uh, consultancy. So what could a professional context look like, an ideal context, when we talk about information? Yes, good morning. I'm pleased to be with you here this morning. Ideal information, in my view, would be information that is right, true, I mean, information that is useful for the person that receives the information and information that would arrive at the right time. It's uh, necessary today for organizations to structure, to masterize their uh, information internally and externally, and that's to fix some collective and organizational rules for a bit of management of their information and also to define a number of ethical rules in their exchange uh, with uh, public, internal public and external public. Information is something that is very local. 
you cannot really fix the same rules in every organization. There is no cut and paste. Cut and paste doesn't work. It's essential for organizations to structure their organization, their, their information, depending on what they do, what their job is, what their internal public is. You don't communicate the same way in a startup, in a big corporate uh, giant, and of course, in, in depending on the culture. Thank you very much. Gaëtan de la Villion, you are a neuroscience doctor and you're the head of COEX, COGEX uh, to improve environments and working methods. What would be the ideal company organization? Good morning, Mathilde. Good morning, all of you. That's a very uh, tricky question. So we need to project ourselves into a utopian world. From a cognitive point of view, we have realized, or society has realized, that we live in a world and in a way we work where the brain is put at the more and more, more and more strain. Infobesity, we call it. We are being bombarded by information, and uh, it took billions of years for our brain to develop, and our brain cannot manage all of the information. We don't have enough resources. For me, an ideal company is a company that has, that has realized this, that has realized the limits of our cognitive resources, and uh, from there, will do everything they it can to preserve sustainably the cognitive resources of its workers. Uh, this can go through two two ways. First, in the two in two ways. First, to integrate the universal functioning of the brain in the design of the organization, the way we work, where we work, to preserve the attention of your co-workers by giving them spaces to reduce the strain, but also give them tools to reduce the strain or uh, also put the social capital, to define social capital as a, as a, as a priority. We are social animals, we need our peers uh, for our social well-being. So that needs to be integrated in the design of an organization. A second lever is a bit more complex to put into practice. Beyond all these processes and structures, we need flexibility to integrate the uh, inter-individual variability. We do not all have the same capacities. To give you one example, uh, about 10% of the population has is, uh, is an, an evening chronotype and the others are a morning chronotype. He, uh, we don't have the same capacities and same vigilance depending on the time of the day. Having working hours which are the same for 100% of the population is not means that we, are, we do not integrate this knowledge and this variability between people. So having a structure, having processes that protect the cognitive resources of all workers by giving a certain leeway so that everybody can adapt uh, themselves depending on their own uh, capacities and the way they function. Thank you very much, Gaëtan. Olivier Charbonnier, you uh, are the general director of these sides to move towards an ideal company. Where do we start? Yes, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mathilde. Now, to um, develop an ideal company, there are three conditions, three provisos. First, the company needs to be aware that it is part of a cognitive society. And in this cognitive society, its raw material is information, and the factories treating this information are the brains. The company needs to understand that first. Information is not something that came on top. It's in the center. The second condition is that the company needs to understand what is the positive and negative impact of all of this. Now, uh, there are three. Basically, the first impact is uh, a uh, phenomenon of uh, acceleration. Oh, when Edison went to his first, first email uh, in 1971, he didn't, couldn't imagine how much uh, uh, transactions would be accelerated. Uh, amplification, speed, uh, events can be amplified, it changes our, our attention, questions our attention. The third element, the third consequence, is, uh, is a catalyst. This information society generates uh, knowledge in an accelerated way and submerging us, and we need to take a step back. So the first condition uh, is uh, uh, information is the raw material, second important effects, and the third one, the most important one, is that we need awareness that it's neither the responsibility of the individual nor of the in, in responsibility of the manager, but the three levels need to be aligned. Micro, meso, and macro, 
We uh, talked about the rules with Caroline earlier on, tools also with Gaetan, taking into account individuals. And we need to align the action around information at three levels, and only that in that way we can succeed. If we only uh, unburden the information on an individual or on an organization alone, then it won't work. So the three levels need to be in, in tune to uh, be able to build an ideal organization. Thank you very much. I think we have a better vision of the ideal workplace, even if, uh, as Gaetan said, this is a faraway objective. It's a utopian vision, but why not? Uh, why not uh, put it more and more into practice in everything we do? Now, the manager, as you said, the, the function of the manager, the role of the manager, it, uh, he has a he or she has a very important role in a company. It's very important, but very difficult to find uh, a good balance to to do this job properly. Talking about uh, information and knowledge, what uh, what what do we need to be vigilant about, Caroline? Where do we need to start? We need to start to tell the managers that they need to walk the talk, be, be an example, even if it's complicated, even if they're between a rock and a hard place in a company. Why? Because we know that the workers copy their information and communication practices from their managers. So the manager has a dual responsibility. He or she needs to be an example. Um, in periods of connection, for instance, where uh, workers will be contacted and not communicate outside working hours, so be able to anticipate uh, so that the teams do not need to be uh, on alert all the time. A manager also needs to show an example to his or her team. Those who would like to be connected and communicate outside working hours, he, need to, he needs to impose working hours, normal working hours in most cases. And on top of that, the manager is responsible for the way the uh, information and communication activity in his department or her department is structured. So uh, the manager needs to choose with the team what are the most appropriate tools to communicate because a department is a place where people work. People uh, work uh, recurrently, so that you can anticipate the tools, the uh, time for to respond, to find that with the team, to fight against individualization of work, choosing the tools, choosing the times, and uh, also defining uh, behavior, for instance, uh, giving a, a, a person seven different tools. Uh, one tool is chosen, should be chosen, then we see um, what the response is, and then we stick to that tool. Otherwise, uh, the other one gets all the notifications from seven different communication tools. Olivier, would you like to add something to that? Yes, I would say that uh, we are moving ahead to very pragmatically with managers. As you said, Mathilde, uh, since managers are, are, very, are under heavy, very heavy strain, we find there is a consensus to say that the, the meeting, the way you uh, organize a meeting is determined on the basis of how information flows. A meeting that is too long, uh, means that people start multitasking during the meeting, checking their SMSs. So the length of a meeting, the way the meeting is organized, the way the information circulates in the meeting is very important. The second element is that shorter meetings, more dynamic meetings uh, mean that the uh, the uh, manager needs to be more flexible in informal matters with lots of information uh, circulating outside the meeting and not inside the meeting. But the most important thing to remember is that the solutions need to be contingent, uh, which means that we work on the principle of experimentation. We invite managers and their teams to experiment in their way, depending on their sociology, their jobs, their constraints, to make a experiments a month long. There are the hyper-connected, the hypo-connected, and the normal connected. And uh, people note everything they feel when they are hyper-connected, miso-connected, or hypo-connected. And then uh, you, come, you come back to the manager and the team with 10 or 12 uh, proposals from the users. And from there, you can build, together with the teams, ad hoc solutions that are in line with their practice and their constraints. Thank you very much. 
Gaeta, I'm turning towards you. Cognitive science. How can cognitive science help us to take into account these essential elements mentioned by Caroline and Olivier? And do cognitive sciences um, take away the guilt uh, and tell us why it's not so simple? in our everyday life to structure your information, to take into account the specificities of other people and everything that has just been said. Now, cognitive sciences alert us and to show us a phenomenon which uh, is going in the same direction as Olivier was saying, and that's how information is perceived. We tend to think that information is something objective uh, some th almost quantifiable, a uh, data, and that we're all going to see this information in the same way. But it really, we perceive uh, information differently. Each individual will treat information differently. And therefore, the role of the manager is to make sure uh, that uh, the uh, perception is shared and make sure that his perception or her perception of the information is the same as the perception the team has. This is a uh, topic we talk about very much in the, when we talk about fake news, how information can be treated very differently between individuals. The information will be treated by our brain and will uh, enter into interaction with all the um, internal images we had about the topic. And uh, in information circulation, we see managers send a request to their uh, team without telling them it's urgent. Um, the manager doesn't think it's urgent, but how is, what is the perception? Uh, it gets an urgent perception because the request comes from the manager. So a manager, uh, uh, on account of the variability of perceptions, needs to create a framework in which uh, the manager and the team will be able to share the same reality, the same perception of information. That's why experiments are going in the right direction, because uh, they will make it possible to define, to, de to, de to, de to develop these perceptions together. First thing. Second thing is to take into account that this is something that takes time. We were conditioned over time. Uh, we're conditioned for information. Uh, ten years of smartphone. The smartphone has reinforced a number of behaviors, as with a dog that you, that you uh, that you tame and, 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 and that you train. Uh, we are being conditioned in the way we treat information. So here again, the manager needs to integrate that as a transformation process that will take time, needs some effort, and cannot be done overnight, not only uh, at, a, at a conference or a training or a charter uh, for the good use of information. Thank you very much. I see one question on the screen. Uh, one, of, of one of us speaks. What about the responsibility on the content in conformity with the values of the company? Would, does anybody would like to re respond to this question? I think that the content, question of content, is essential, of course, crucial. I'm fascinated that uh, at the 21st century, when information is the black gold of all organizations, information is so important, but we do not evaluate the managers in the way they produce information. There are some bad practice, for instance, to send a first mail uh, with a very partial request and then all day long send additional requests and each time requesting something more. This is not acceptable today because it, uh, it interrupts your work constantly, it takes uh, twice as much time. So the quality of information uh, needs to be part of the evaluation of the way a manager works and, and an executive works. Unfortunately, it's not being done. Why should it also be integrated in the way managers are being evaluated? Well, how males are being treated, it's 30% of the time of a manager, 30% males. So we all have a collective responsibility and an individual responsibility. This needs to be integrated in the evaluation and assessment of managers. Anybody would like to add something? Yes, I'd like to come back to what Caroline was saying. I share what she says. We work with Gaetan on uh, this uh, idea of the uh, co uh, cognitive footprint. Uh, when I send a mail, a very long, long mail, I will leave a cognitive footprint, a much stronger footprint, 
Then uh, when I send, send a very short mail, when I send the mail to 100 people, the footprint will be even greater. So we work uh, 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 with Gaetan on the matter of the evaluation of the cognitive footprint in an organization. Because for an individual, it's always uh, delicate, it's always tricky. But uh, I'm a victim, but um, I'm also the henchman. I, uh, as, as far as information is concerned, I leave an information footprint. So we need to look at practice. This is a central qu question, and it uh, needs to be much more, more, more central than today. So how do we do that? For instance, I'm sending a mail, and I'm saying, well, it's a very long mail. What should I do? Do I separate this into different subjects? Do I send f a number of mails, uh, uh, one later on? What do I do when I have an email? There's five points of information. Either I ask a question, what would be the good advice in these cases? That's what we observe. It's very common sense. It's really common sense. I'll be as short as possible. Now, possibly some information should be sent by mail, but perhaps better to talk over the phone. There is no prescription for good mails or bad mails, but you need to ask yourself each time, what is the cognitive footprint you're going to leave? Let's integrate the idea that we, we have the idea that we have a carbon footprint when we take our car. This should be this, done the same when we use information. What is our information, our cognitive footprint? So we should try to reduce our cognitive footprint as much as possible. There are some good rules, for instance. One mail, one topic. This sounds a very good rule because today uh, we trace activity a lot. And to be able to classify the mail uh, sent by uh, uh, correspondent is, is easy. So the overload is not the quantity, but the difficulty to treat. When you get a mail with 10 different topics, it's very complicated. Because how are you going to answer? Only one part or all of the parts? So one mail, one topic is much easier to deal with. And another good practice from the Anglo-Saxon countries is to uh, say before, dear Frank or dear Laura, just one sentence when you have a complicated long, longer mail, one sentence that summarizes what you are going to say in a very short sentence. And this uh, helps people to, uh, uh, to, to put a priority on different mails they receive. As I said at the beginning of the roundtable, digital tools are great. They facilitated our work. We reduced uh, the time to transfer information to almost nothing. Now, this speed, is it still a, a gain of time and it's still a, a synonym with the quality of work? Caroline. Big question. Olivier, Olivier was talking about acceleration earlier on. This is one of the huge aspects of the introduction of digital technologies in our work. Digital tools uh, made it possible to synchronize everybody with everybody in the world seven, uh, seven hours, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So a huge impact. So we still we need to add more time to our exchanges. There are some good practices. Some organizations have fixed rules. For instance, uh, uh, give people 48 hours or 24 hours to respond to a mail internally or externally so that when there is an urgent request, this urgent request is not sent by mail. So, and to get people away from their mailbox, because what we find with this acceleration is that there is a negative impact in terms of, in cognitive terms, as you said earlier on, but also the way we uh, concentrate, the way we deal with information, our co capacity to concentrate. We can no longer manage information, but there's too much going too quickly. There is a risk uh, with uh, innovation. Uh, linked to the productivity of the organization. Why? Because we know that uh, interruptions, when you check your mailbox all the time, means that your work is being interrupted all the time, and it's difficult to refocus again on your initial task. The task you to focus again on your initial task is 10 to 20 times the time of the distraction. So one huge recommendation is not to deal your mails uh, as you go along, but do it in one go, batch-wise, uh, at one point in time over the day, but not all day long. I'm being told very often, well, everything is being, everything is urgent. Is everything really urgent, or is uh, should urgency only be part, a small part of our day? If you have a good work organization, uh, urgency should be 10% of the activity of the organization. 
But this acceleration in our work generated by the digital tools uh, makes, it, makes it possible to call somebody within 10 minutes, although it's not necessary. Uh, he, he or she could have anticipated this. We are victims of this infobesity, but we're also the actors. We're also the perpetrators. For ethical rules, for better communication between ourselves, you need to ask ourselves, is uh, maybe we should have asked him yesterday, could we have asked him yesterday, add more time and be correct in terms of what you expect in terms of response time from your correspondence. What I observe is that emails in a company is a mirror of the organization and its internal relations, hierarchical relations, among others. One bad practice that is spreading is that managers ask their teams when they're in a meeting uh, to uh, be available in real time to answer questions uh, because they didn't have the time to prepare the meeting. They didn't have the time to prepare a meeting. They asked their team to help them in real time for supplying figures and information. And all this maintains everybody uh, in the immediacy. And behind the immediacy, there cannot be quality. That's uh, very important. If everything is immediate, it cannot be quality. 10 percent. 10% out of our working week is half a day. So if you have uh, less than half a day to spend with urgent matters, you're fine. If it's not the case, you should listen to what our uh, correspondents are saying here. Gaetan, 10%, how do you react to the 10% of urgent matters in a day or in a week? Interesting figure because uh, it uh, can be the mirror of how the, the way our brain deals with information. Our brain is not made for dealing with urgent matters from morning to, do, to, to evening. Urgent matters could in the past indicate a risk a fatal risk. So we are animals that are meant to survive. So when I get an urgency, an urgent request, my whole brain, all my attention, my whole organism is going to react, which will uh, enable us to respond to challenges. So it's a very good thing, but it shouldn't be done permanently from morning to evening, all day long, and certainly not outside. Now, you may ask yourself the question about time. As Olivier was saying, it needs to become a reflex to ask yourself the question, what is the cognitive footprint you leave when you send a mail? You also need to ask yourself, what is the, our relationship to time, the time we have and the way our brain is going to deal with the information over time? Uh, a few weeks ago, we had the president of MEDEF in France, who is the main uh, uh, work, uh, employer's organization, saying that the wealth of a country can be reduced to the sum or the multiplication of the time worked by worker times the number of workers in the country, which means that a uh, work, a cognitive activity, can be measured in the time I spent on a task. Our brain will be dealing with information outside the time spent on a task that was studied in sleep. This is one of the time of inactivity which is most characteristic, apparently, because our brain is even more active during uh, our sleep. Our body is not working, but our brain is going to repeat sequences uh, from the day. And these times of inactivity will create new associations, associations between information that were not associated before because we're freewheeling. The brain is freewheeling, so it can do whatever it likes. Therefore, this time of recovery, whether it's sleep, but also breaks during the day, uh, a nap uh, after lunch, which is necessary for about 30% of the population, will give our brain a, a possibility to recover from all the urgent matters that uh, produce hormones, which are toxic in the long term, and also allow our brain to get new creative ideas, better remember information and create knowledge. So we should consider time, slow down and allow workers, whether by giving them time or space or culture, to uh, give themselves authorization to take this time to recover and disconnect uh, also during working time. This connection for a number of years now has, uh, has been a broad consensus and these are things that are changing outside working time. Now we need to ask this question, not necessarily in, in law, but also the way we organize our working time over the day to slow down and become more efficient in our tasks and have more resources in the evening when you come home. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Um, Olivier, Caroline, Gaëtan have indicated quite clearly the needs and individual capacities as well. Everybody said so. 
the soon, are you in a disruptive mode and uh, being ourselves uh, in, uh, under pressure from the um, exterior side, uh, the more we need uh, to adapt? Mm, could we put the collective interest here, the company interest uh, um, in the focus as well? What I would like to react to things being just said here by uh, the panel partners uh, as an individual, when you uh, receive mails, uh, two things happen. Uh, that's what uh, workers tell us when we're discussing we try to understand the phenomenon. First of all, what, what happening beforehand in Charlie Chaplin's head, you, you remember in modern times when uh, the production chain uh, was uh, uh, seeming to speed up because he lost some time. If we don't uh, process the mails immediately, we have the impression that we will uh, have to run after them all day long, or it may be possible even in the evening because we didn't do so during daytime. So there's an urgency uh, a feeling, quite subjective here, that's coming up. Uh, and uh, we are um, overrun by uh, things like that, maybe the non-urgent ones. And, uh, Another element being mentioned here by Kadat, so when you receive mails, there's adrenaline coming up. Uh, you're, you're curious, you want to know what's in it. Uh, so you are not always quite honest. You could not see it, but you still want to go there. Mm, uh, that being said, we um, have uh, simply observed uh, that we want to have a little bit of fun, of, uh, of course, next to running behind uh, necessities and urgencies. Uh, but there's a, a positive side to it as well. This allows us to uh, work in a collective, to interact uh, with others. Uh, and uh, finally, it's also because uh, we, we do have these connections and these mails uh, that we are living within society. We're not isolated on our own. And uh, as a result of that, I don't have a solution now, but just a proposal maybe. Uh, let's not uh, uh, try, promise here to find the big solution. We are, uh, are living interconnected, but uh, let's go on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, let's have a debate uh, around a coffee machine uh, amongst ourselves. And afterwards, uh, try with a uh, micro-experiment, have a collective benefit here uh, to be brought up in a, in a meeting, to calm down things collectively, individually, we might not be able to do so. So in the group with the manager and the whole uh, team, we can uh, bring together these micro experiments and uh, day by day we uh, adapt and, and find solutions on a local basis. Thank you very much. This allowed us uh, to have a better insight in the time factor here. And we could uh, bring up the fact as well that uh, digitization is uh, delivering a hyper individualization of work modes, a hyper individualization in our processing of information as well. And this leads us uh, to another topic. At the same time, we take up questions being asked online here because uh, there's certain crossroads here um, between our debate and questions here. Separation between work time and private life with teleworking on a almost permanent basis. Uh, so this uh, separation is being reduced. Uh, and then uh, uh, the necessity to process mails in the evening or during the weekends, do you have to uh, restructure this collectively to find a better way? Well, these are the ideas in the online questions. Carolina, concerning uh, the teleworking uh, um, phase on an almost permanent basis right now. Well, in the present era of uh, COVID, we have uh, a lot of teleworking indeed. Uh, but uh, teleworking would be good if your children were not uh, back home as well. So we had to do both. Uh, so we have a, a restricted family life uh, in confinement, in the, in the lockdown at home, and work as well. So both together were quite uh, stressful. So studies have shown that we have an increase of psychosocial problems, uh, more depression. Uh, more separations uh, so since this uh, uh, the beginning of this uh, lockdown phase so not really good times uh, but telework uh, can work as well telework uh, should work uh, linked to certain conditions up front of course it should not be imposed it's complicated if you want to impose it to uh, and, uh, PSR Peugeot Citroën have announced this uh, summer that uh, four days out of five for all workers uh, would be in teleworking uh, necessarily and since the announcement of uh, this restructuring. The trade unions have been coming up. Uh, that's not a good decision. People have to come back to the workplace. Uh, so there's a lot of contradictory elements here. People, Some people want to be uh, in telework uh, conditions as much as possible. Others want to go back uh, to the workplace. Uh, younger people uh, prefer to work locally within the company and go back. Uh, but in the information and communication um, activities outside uh, the official work 
times uh, one of the questions was leading to that. There's an individual responsibility here as well, not to give an, uh, a habit to, to your uh, discussion partners uh, that you are available all uh, all the time, even outside uh, the working hours. Uh, so the working together with uh, technology allows us to work any time of day or night. Flexibility is highly appreciated by managers, uh, but it can only work if uh, these uh, work times are not imposed to all others outside of the classic work uh, our grid, um, because this would lead to a situation where you work uh, from um, midnight to 11.59 p.m., so all day round. Um, so the, um, well, how can we make sure that there's no pressure outside the working hours of, um, through emails, for instance, uh, what has to be negotiated with companies, especially with your own manager? You have to determine with them certain rules allowing you to have an exchange in case of urgency, but not necessarily via your mailbox, uh, because otherwise you're connected uh, all the time to your uh, mailbox. Uh, and certain uh, managers told me, well, I'm um, looking at the mails, but I never answer. Well, the uh, cognitive uh, pressure is still there. It starts as soon as you read your mails, of course. And if you read a mail at uh, 9 p.m. on Friday night, uh, and it's uh, unpleasant or a new problem coming up, uh, quite evidently, this will uh, be working on you all weekend long until the next Monday. So you have to determine certain conditions with your manager and the levels of urgency and only by phone and not by mail, for instance. Thank you for that. Mm, I'll give you the floor, Gaetan. Kogix has studied uh, the impact of this kind of work, telework as well, especially after the generalized uh, telework period of COVID uh, uh, on um, mental uh, pressure, anxiety, and other phenomena of the type. Can you deliver some results? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, very first uh, observation here uh, shared by many is, uh, and I could uh, just uh, uh, tell you that I had the same experience with concerning children. But we could see that the majority of workers uh, has been able to organize themselves. Uh, and all of a sudden, they had a flexibility in the organization of their work rhythm, uh, and they could adapt it to their own needs. Uh, and no one was there to uh, uh, tell them that they shouldn't have a nap uh, in the middle of the day or things like that. Uh, and this was uh, highly beneficial. And the results we reached here, there is one alerting point. At, towards the end of the uh, lockdown period, one-fourth of the workers uh, base, with a basis of 700 people, one quarter, uh, said that they have a cognitive and social social resource level at a very low level. So they had a lot of anxiety, lower social capacity, a lower level of involvement. So it's not as romanticized as it had been indicated in the media. So a lot of companies had to see that there was a higher level of efficiency in the COVID times, less time lost in transportation, more efficiency for workers. Some were even thinking uh, of 100% uh, teleworking in Europe and elsewhere, but one quarter of workers involved uh, will not be able to follow along on the long run. Uh, and there's uh, uh, a long raging risk for their efficiency and well being as well. And that was about people not having work modes adapted to telework, uh, not able to deconnect really in the evening or on weekends, not uh, able to structure their breaks, uh, and uh, not uh, sufficient cognitive cognitive capacities in order to permanently show their efficiency, matter of culture maybe as well. I'm not an expert here, uh, but leading to a lot of questions, but work modes uh, at home are a very important element here, linked to housing as well, obviously. And this leads to a lot of problems uh, if you should push for even more telework uh, and then adapt possibly the uh, homes of the teleworkers. Uh, and then you were talking about uh, certain uh, pressure here and constraints. Uh, when you have uh, several thousand workers, uh, well, you have to impose a certain alternating, alternating rhythm between telework and uh, work uh, within the company. Workers would be best placed to judge uh, their own uh, work rhythm. Uh, those wanting telework uh, are those uh, having uh, sufficient uh, resource, cognitive and social resource level. 
uh, for that uh, and they have adapted work modes for telework. On the other way around, people wanting to come back to the, the office need to come back to the office to reach again a high level of efficiency because their way of working back home does not allow them to have an accomplishment reached uh, at work and to do all they have to do. It's complicated, but there's a real matter around, around uh, a certain freedom given to workers to find their own uh, ideal rhythm between telework and uh, uh, office work, uh, and this would uh, uh, break the uh, uh, impression that people want to do telework in order to work less. Thank you for that. Uh, Olivier, uh, what are the risks of a hyper individualization of work and uh, what would allow us uh, to have these recent experiments, a uh, large scale of telework, uh, uh, put into practice? Well, we had a, a huge experimentation phase here for that. I think that we can see three organization modes coming up um, at the end of this uh, test period, and the combination of th the three might be an ideal approach uh, instead of just one of them. The first is the mechanized uh, um, workplace uh, for uh, 100 years and more. This has been existing, mechanical uh, surroundings uh, with restrictions, control, sanctions possibly, uh, vertical companies uh, uh, closed up to the outer world rather, and this information uh, overload uh, would be superimposed to all things you've been uh, doing beforehand. Uh, and uh, this will be invading your work surrounding and you're all just on your own. Uh, with all these information flows in the 2000 years, you have seen new startups uh, as a second step, uh, reorganization uh, of companies, uh, and this new organization mode is bringing up another type of problem. The individual is on his or her own, uh, not in a captive environment, but uh, without a safety net. Uh, uh, it's an ultra-liberal company structure, and you have to live with that uh, and permanently be aware of upcoming information flows, your slave of the job uh, day and night. And then the third model is coming up, it's quite interesting in my view, the model of uh, organic companies, uh, a company giving a new place uh, to living people. The person is there, we, we need him or her, uh, the mechanical approaches here, we need them, uh, we have several thousand people working together in processes, we need uh, this human input, but on the other hand, uh, we might, instead of being crushed by the two former models, uh, uh, give a uh, central part again to the human, to, to the living part of it all, mm, by uh, giving more value to the presence aspect or be uh, in your office. The working spaces are resourceful spaces. Uh, you want to go there to be together, to get in touch with it, uh, other literally, and uh, mm, you have not uh, the disadvantages of the um, mechanized uh, work surrounding or the ultra-liberalized uh, work surrounding, but it's uh, to guess, and our last book uh, talked about this in this digitalized work, how can we remain human? And more than ever after this COVID experience now, more than ever the question of how humanity and our capacity to remain human in this mechanized world, the digital uh, world on the other side, uh, what is up to us then uh, day by day to uh, impose ourselves as human factor. Thank you for that. Now let's uh, have about 10 minutes uh, for all your questions online. In the chat we've received several ones already, so don't hesitate to add some more. I've read to them just beforehand. A practical question here uh, concerning how to do it and broader questions as well. Uh, I hope you're ready for this. Let's start with the practical aspect. Uh, we see more and more WhatsApp uh, um, activity for com pro communication uh, as a uh, tool. It's uh, principally a personal uh, uh, matter. And is uh, this uh, very uh, mixture of professional and personal communication to be uh, um, forbidden? What this leads us back to another question concerning the zero mail company. We had that just before. All is a matter of usage of all these tools. Uh, do you want to target a zero mail company? Um, Atos in France have, have tried to do so. They stopped the test uh, or the experimentation phase because you, email was still useful as a tool when used adequately. Uh, and WhatsApp is quite uh, uh, a similar element. Uh, WhatsApp is really useful when uh, you're uh, internal to one service. Uh, or department, uh, but it should not replace the uh, virtual 
virtual uh, coffee machines or anything. So you should, you should not have specific uh, demands put to someone uh, via WhatsApp. Uh, you can inform your team when you're coming out of a meeting. Well, this information has been announced. Uh, we want to spread it right now. Uh, so um, coffee machine type uh, information, not broad strategical elements or specific demands to one person. Someone belonging to a WhatsApp group is not obliged to connect uh, on a real-time basis and uh, react to it uh, on a daily uh, basis. Uh, they can react uh, when there's a location coming up and they can disconnect. Uh, there's no problem. Uh, and WhatsApp will not allow any kind of traceability information like it would be the case via mail. So the question is now is to use the different tools according to their capacities. Mail is extremely useful still. And I don't think that uh, emails should be taken out of uh, organizations altogether. WhatsApp is quite useful for the animation of a group uh, for good mood within the team or department. Uh, young people use it a lot within companies, but uh, you should know what type of information you try to spread via the different tools. Thank you for that. Then we have a very uh, specific question. Uh, I have to uh, uh, deliver a solution uh, for compliance in my department uh, together with digitization uh, in order to evaluate partners from a point of view of their environmental responsibility, social responsibility, political. Uh, 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 I can do. Uh, yeah. Do you have 30 minutes for my answer? Uh, does anyone uh, want to give some input here? It's a very broad question indeed. Uh, well, well, we're going to need um, at, uh, certainly more than 30 seconds for this. Uh, well, first uh, approach for any kind of answer here, maybe now, and then the uh, balance uh, uh, between different levels of urgency. How can we s strike a balance here? between uh, the different human factors, uh, choosing my communication channel, everything is being automatized, uh, I deliver information, and all those needing it should be able to uh, select and uh, take it up. Well, this is an ultra-important topic. It's of central importance, really. Um, it is uh, well known, but it's uh, about uh, the man-machine connection. Uh, we will not be replaced by machines, uh, but there's a topic coming up, which is not new. How can we coexist? Uh, we had uh, machines. Uh, helping more and more, some machines even replacing us, but not all together. How can we coexist with uh, any type of machine? Uh, we should not be uh, allow machines to crush us with the automatized uh, functions uh, and uh, sometimes simplistic approach of industrialization uh, of processes uh, in a digital context. On the other hand, uh, we should not push aside uh, machines and uh, deny their capacities. This is the flow of history, and we should go along. If we could find nowadays a situation where machines take up more space but in a targeted way, well, I think um, Gaetan is taking this up in all their tests as well. An automatized approach is not enough, but we can uh, take up information from that as well. There will be more qualification for workers. Uh, automatized solutions uh, can help us take uh, decisions but should not replace us in taking decisions. Otherwise, uh, the world will be going crazy. So uh, live uh, in coexistence with machines is a central uh, question here. And this will be different from one trade to another one job to another. We have to talk about it on a daily basis because the topic is of major importance here. Thank you for that, Olivier. Another broad question again, the idea of deceleration. Is it acceptable in the company world? moving towards a slow economy? Are we wanting to go there? Well, I wouldn't talk about slow economy, but internally uh, there should certain be, certainly be certain approaches of that kind, not necessarily slowing down the whole economy uh, or the economic model of a company, but at least wonder how we could at least maintain the same economic model while slowing down certain processes. Certain companies are thinking about that more and more even uh, moving towards a four-day week, taking out 20 percent of the efforts uh, and reorganize the internal processes uh, in order to make sure that my workers have more free time, uh, longer weekends, or uh, take up uh, personal projects uh, to enrich themselves while maintaining the same economic level without wanting to come back uh, completely or reducing the rhythm of global economy. We can nevertheless ask the question of a certain slowing down of work modes and society as a whole.
Well, uh, after what uh, Gaëtan just said, I'd like to uh, uh, support this approach as well. Get away from the idea of measuring all the time. Measurement is the worst enemy in uh, time reduction uh, uh, matters. Uh, maybe work will become even more intense through that. Uh, Sociologists uh, will uh, publish a book, Ahmoud Rosa, first work uh, called uh, Acceleration, uh, and then the next book, Resonance, the theory of uh, resonance. Uh, and Ahmoud Rosa uh, is talking about the world as it is, but taken in a, from a different approach and uh, introducing the idea um, that we could perform differently uh, as compared to what we've known for 100 years now. But the uh, theory of resonance could be brought up using time differently. And now we have a certain possibility to get out of the usual frame, framework, uh, some more oxygen in our working time and our um, connection to other people. Maybe one more question uh, uh, leading towards one of the afternoon uh, uh, roundtables. Uh, what about the uh, urgency uh, question uh, being quite different from one generation to another? We have a um, panel this afternoon. Uh, can we see or perceive urgency differently according to age? Well, without uh, answering completely the question as such, which is really broad, there's uh, um, a lot of questions still about uh, the generation uh, uh, difference uh, within companies, uh, so at work, but in general as well. We have seen both cases. Is it a situation where young people, my children, or uh, my younger co-workers are more stupid due to technologies and internet? Some say so. Or do they react more quickly and more? intelligent and the older ones are completely left aside. We should uh, get out of these uh, caricatures of vision in comparing the generations. Uh, our brain has taken millions of years to become what it is today. Uh, young parents and managers uh, being afraid of upcoming generations. No, they have the same brain. They have different habits uh, on the other hand and uh, behaviors which are not the same. This can be virtuous or not. So there should not be uh, any ideology brought up in this. So we have to work on it uh, and in one sense or the other with uh, young generations as well. Okay, concerning the uh, concept of urgency, what I can see is that young people are quite willing today to um, preserve their personal life much more than the former uh, generations before them. And so the Generation Z and even Generation Y has been uh, have been quite vigilant. They're children of the crisis. They don't want to give everything uh, to uh, the society. They want to preserve some kind of personal life and organizations uh, putting together uh, the aspects or approaches for deconnection, deconnecting their workers um, during their evening time, during weekends and the holiday periods. Well, these are companies where young people really want to go and work, and this is an HR marketing uh, instrument of a lot of importance. Uh, on the other hand, companies uh, having the tendency to communicate uh, at any time during day and night are uh, pushing away young talents. This is a quite a clear trend, and companies have to take this into account. Uh, maybe if you allow me 30 more seconds, uh, have a look at the, the Silicon Valley, as, as often in, in, in the course of time, the, in the school, the Waldorf school, uh, more particularly, where most of uh, bosses of startups are sending their children. And this uh, school has an interesting approach. Computers are not being used before the age of 13 or 14, so you should uh, dream and uh, walk around and uh, try things uh, before you are fully connected, uh, uh, leading maybe to a more human life as it would be in a fully digitized world. So uh, there's uh, certain fixed concepts that young people are, have been born with a, with a mouse and a computer. Uh, this is not really the case. And maybe this is the most difficult part now to try and find a way where you can have a certain distance and interest to young people, uh, allowing them to get out of of these uh, um, ideas and uh, that is just all about digitization uh, and come back to an approach with a more human society. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe one recommendation, very practical one uh, for um, knowledge management, uh, um, digital well-being and so on and so forth. Go ahead. This was not foreseen, but this is, well, that was a surprise. There you go. So one recommendation. Uh, 
practical numbers. Uh, instead of uh, three addressations, uh, we change uh, by email. We change our communication mode. Not all day long. Uh, ping pong mails all day long. Thank you for that. Practical recommendation from my side, more for managers or people in charge. As I said before, create a framework for the uh, real representation of interests. Uh, have an exchange with the whole team on these topics. Uh, like we said before, there's no miracle method. Uh, it has to be adapted to the respective organizations, uh, big or small, and uh, have a continuous exchange and participation. A practical recommendation from my side, uh, uh, within a team, you have to learn to communicate differently, to, uh, uh, to do drawings and put visually what we want and need uh, to have a more visual impact on colleagues in the team. And quite often, this become uh, very playful and, uh, and fun. Uh, so a learning of um, uh, a new way of communicating our wishes and needs in, uh, in the organization. Thank you to all of you, uh, the participants of the panel, and all our audience. Uh, very interesting exchange and maybe more serene uh, way of working, adapted way with fluid communication in our daily business life. Uh, for experiments, uh, the concept has been brought up different times. We do have possibilities to co-create pilot projects within IMS. Uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us, and we can certainly discuss about it more profoundly. As a continuation on this topic, uh, in the chat, uh, we have uh, a link to uh, Caroline's book uh, on concerning uh, the specificity of information overload, Olivier of the digitized community, and the blog uh, done by Gaetan concerning the uh, usine cognitive, cognitive uh, uh, plants. So now it's our midday break. Uh, go and have a look uh, at our um, virtual exhibition. You will have a link, uh, live stream exhibition or visit exhibition, uh, as you can find it on the platform from which uh, we are. you are taking part in uh, the event. We'll get together at uh, 2 p.m. for the next roundtable. Hyperconnected people, uh, hyperconnected people and uh, techno uh, savvy people. Uh, let's do the first step. Uh, and until then, please share your reactions, difficulties, or any other question uh, on our chat or on the social networks. Uh, we are on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter, hashtag uh, LSF2020. Thank you very much.